television highlights of the news of yesteryear. historic pictures of events that resulted in a constitutional amendment. It's 1917, and the 69-year drive by women for the right to vote is climaxed by this appeal at the White House. In 1869, Susan B. Anthony became chairman of the executive committee of the National Women's Suffrage Association. And the ensuing years saw parades like this. In Washington in 1917, picketing resulted in police action. And even as President Wilson was considering the women's appeal, District of Columbia police rolled out from their station house to take pickets into custody. Temporarily held, these women were to wait until May for Wilson to advocate formation of the House Committee on Woman Suffrage. The committee's report was to result three years later in the 19th Amendment, the right of women to vote. Vice President Marshall signs. First state ratification came from Illinois where Governor Loudon affixed his signature to be followed by enough states to put the amendment into effect. Most dramatic step to date in women's campaign for equal rights is evident early. Women in Illinois are quick to register and vote, while energetic suffrage adherents realize their long campaign is over. years after Congress first had been presented with the proposed amendment and had tabled it over severe protest from feminine leaders, women all over the nation took their place at the polls. Alice Paul, suffrage leader, is first to vote by mail in New Jersey. Miss Paul, a dramatic campaigner, had gone on a hunger strike earlier in an effort to force congressional action. Here in Boston at the state capitol, victory parades passed before then-Governor Coolidge and his staff. The long fight was officially over. Born in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, the suffrage movement, in the words of leader Carrie Chapman Catt, was a long story of hard work and heartaches, but it was crowned by victory. Statues honoring women are shown by Speaker Gillette. Center statue is Susan B. Anthony, pioneer for women's suffrage. It's the late 1920s, and Florence Ziegfeld, famous Follies producer, selects his most beautiful showgirl. Many years that I've been identified with the American theater, I have glorified many beautiful girls. I take great pleasure in presenting Miss Grace Moore of the present Follies, whom I consider the most beautiful brunette in the world today. I've often been asked, why I have more blondes than brunettes in my show. The truth is, there are more beautiful blondes in the world than there are brunettes. As you can see, Miss Moore not only has marvelous features, but also the beautiful form necessary to become a Ziegfeld girl. <laughs> High speed in 1931. The international Schneider Cup races narrow down to a finish at Calshot, England, with the United States, Italy, and France already removed from the competition. Only Britain remains, and its entry is about to race against time. As Lieutenant Stainford pushes his ship to the limit, watchers realize that 18 years before, winner of the first Schneider Trophy reached 45 and three quarter miles per hour. The tiny ship you're watching being pulled ashore set a new world's record, and don't forget it's 1931, a 404 miles per hour. Stainford, Britain's racing ace. Recognize him? You should. It's Ben Turpin, 
slapstick star of the 1920s. Here, Ben decides against diving off the Hotel Astor roof and instead points out New York's high spots to Mrs. Turpin. Here is the comedian with one of New York's greatest showmen, S.L. Rothafel, better known as Roxy. The face that made him famous and the eyes that came across. Now let's go to the Capitol. Coolidge is president, and Helen Keller, deaf and blind since she was nine months old, visits Mrs. Coolidge. Miss Keller's triumph over handicaps was world acknowledged. Authoress, educator, inspiration to unfortunates, this was Helen Keller. John Philip Sousa, America's March King, directs traffic instead of a band. It's Los Angeles here, but a countrywide tour brings Sousa to Washington, D.C., where the leader, who batoned the Marine Band from 1880 to 1892, takes over again to entertain President Hoover and British envoys. The composer of hundreds of marches, including Stars and Stripes Forever, meets his successor as director of the Marine Band, Captain Taylor Branson. to Maine suffer as a hurricane hits. It's September 1938, and Long Island bears the brunt of a tropical hurricane that culminates in the worst storm in history. Torrential rains and a flood join the high winds to leave wreckage like this in seven northeastern states. Here in Westport, Long Island, hundreds of homes are destroyed, and thousands barely escape with their lives as they flee before the force of the deluge. Rail communications are cut. Long Island is isolated. As the hurricane roared in at 100 miles an hour, the shoreline of Long Island became a shambles. Bridges were wrecked. Boats were driven from their moorings and flung ashore. And even tankers hurled to the land, smashing piers and docks and resulting in huge property damage. This is an actual scene of rescue during the storm. New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts are hardest hit. But none of the Northeast states escaped the fury of the deluge. 500 lost their lives in the disaster which spread from Cape May to Cape Cod. Property losses were over $40 million, with floods responsible for most of the damage in Long Island. Connecticut sees raging fires follow the surge of the sea. Here in New London, flames fanned by the gales spread rapidly throughout the helpless city. Man's greatest aids, fire and water, combine in a mission of destruction. latest in fashion and frills in 1914, with Lady Duff Gordon taking the credit for these creations. Chinchilla stole and muff set off this afternoon dress. While here, an ermine wrap covers a cocktail ensemble with stars of side drape, harem skirt, cloche hats with aigrettes, and a large ostrich feather fan. What have we here? It's an evening gown of flesh tulle and opalescent trim, introducing a plunging neckline both fore and aft. Dancing dress of blue soiree silk. Wide silk sash draws in the gown at the waist. This model features deep square décolleté and side panier. Evening gown of red tulle studded with red sequin bands. The gown highlights a full tiered skirt with uneven hemline. From the top, a short wavy coiffure, to the bottom, white satin shoes with standing buckles. Another World War I wonder. At the end of a 50-year negotiation, the United States purchases the Virgin Islands. 
It's 1917, and the Danish West Indies becomes America's territory as a result of purchase details begun in 1867. St. Thomas Island, part of the 133 square miles for which the United States paid Denmark $25 million. Although subject to earthquakes and hurricanes, the Virgin Islands produces tobacco in quantity. Believed discovered by Christopher Columbus on his second voyage in 1493, the new United States acquisition consists of 100 small islands lying east of Puerto Rico between the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. Denmark cedes its rights in the Western Hemisphere as the United States annexes new territory. Come on, kids, we're going to Harvard. It's 1929, and an invitation race starring the speedster from Finland, the man who introduced a new era in distance running is with us. The fellow we're watching is Pavel Nurmi. Here he shows the form that carried him to victory, just as it did on dozens of tracks during his two visits to this country. Nermi's still leading, and as the speedsters come toward the last turn, it's Pavel pouring it on to pound out a still greater advantage. The tape coming up, and it's Nermi snapping it to cop this Cambridge classic. Follow Nermi, the flying fin. Most thrilling of all winter sports, the bobsled race. It's 1933, Lake Placid, New York. And it's the Stevens brothers, champions in this perilous pastime, competing in the National Amateur Athletic Union meet. I'm glad they're aboard and not me. But the Stevens boys stick to it and come over the line in record-breaking time. Bob Sledding's best, the Stevens brothers. 